Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Martin Bryant? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Martin Bryant was born in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia, on May 7, 1967. When he was young, he was frequently involved in conflicts and other types of trouble. He was occasionally the victim of bullying, but was also frequently the perpetrator. He engaged in a variety of antisocial behavior, including being violent, irritating, callous, and distant. His mother referred to him as different and annoying, even from a very young age. In 1977, he was suspended from school. A mental health assessment conducted after that indicated he had tortured small animals. This behavior is often tied to psychopathy. Bryant returned to school, but he was still harassed by other students. He was given a disability pension due to his disturbed mood and low intellectual functioning. In addition to receiving the pension, he worked as a gardener and handyman. When Bryant was 19, he tried to build a lawn mowing service. He met a woman named Helen Harvey. She was 54 years old, quite wealthy, and lived with her mother. She hired Bryant to take care of certain things around her mansion in Newtown, which is a suburb of Hobart. He took care of the 40 cats she had living in her garage and the 14 dogs living inside the mansion. After Harvey's mother died in 1990, she invited Bryant to live in the mansion with her. They started spending massive amounts of money. For example, in the span of less than three years, they bought over 30 new vehicles. Bryant was reassessed for his disability pension. The assessment concluded that Bryant was routinely threatening violence, saying that he would like to go around and shoot people. The assessment indicated that it was unsafe to allow Martin Bryant out of his parents' control. Harvey and Bryant moved to a farm that she had purchased in a rural community southeast of Tasmania. At some point, Harvey created a will and named Bryant as the sole beneficiary. After moving, it was clear that Bryant wasn't going to get along with the neighbors or anyone else in the area. He would use an air gun to shoot at tourists and dogs. Bryant had this habit when he was riding in a vehicle of reaching across to the driver's side and grabbing the steering wheel. He was involved in three accidents due to this behavior. In response, Harvey never drove any faster than 37 miles per hour. It's not clear if she never heard of the concept of a back seat or just not taking somebody in the vehicle with her. I guess she thought that at this speed, she could have survived a collision. In October of 1992, Harvey was driving her vehicle with Bryant in the passenger seat when the vehicle veered into the wrong lane and collided head-on with another vehicle. Harvey died as a result. Bryant was in the hospital for seven months. The police suspected that Bryant had caused the collision, but they could not prove it. Bryant inherited about $570,000 in cash and property from Harvey. His assets were placed under the management of public trustees due to his limited intellectual functioning. Bryant's father, Maurice, started looking after the farm. He would die in 1993. It is believed he brought an end to his own life. Bryant moved to the mansion in Newtown after selling the farm. He started dressing in ways that attracted negative attention. Some of his unusual apparel choices included lizard skin shoes, a Panama hat, and an electric blue suit. He carried around a briefcase and told people that he had a job that paid well. When he would go to eat at a local restaurant, the customers and staff would laugh at him. From 1993 until 1995, he traveled to other countries 14 different times. He enjoyed having conversations with passengers on the flight, but at his destinations, people still avoided him, the same thing that happened to him in Tasmania. He kept a detailed record of those conversations with the airline passengers, as if he was quite proud of those interactions. In reality, the passengers were stuck next to him and were probably just trying to be polite. 
sitting next to Bryant was probably only marginally more acceptable than exiting the plane in mid-flight. The worst flights of those passengers' lives were the best flights that Martin Bryant ever had. Bryant started believing that people were against him. Every time he tried to make friends, he was pushed away. He already had some difficulties with alcohol, and now his use increased dramatically. Sometime in early 1996, he decided to conduct an attack with the goal of making everyone remember him. He wanted to murder a number of people. He eventually decided to execute the attack in Port Arthur, Tasmania. He planned it for months. Bryant may have had another motivation as well, at least for his first targets. His father had tried to buy a bed and breakfast called Seascape, but the deal fell through. Bryant's father accused the owners, David and Nolene Martin, of cheating him. Bryant may have thought that this incident led to his father ending his own life. On April 28, 1996, Bryant loaded his yellow Volvo with a Colt AR-15 SP-1 carbine, a Belgian FN rifle, and a shotgun. He drove to the Seascape Bed and Breakfast and killed David and Nolene Martin. He left their bodies in their bed. Bryant then made his way to the Broad Arrow Cafe in Port Arthur. This was at about 1.10 p.m. After eating at the cafe, he retrieved the AR-15 and opened fire. He continued his shooting in the gift shop. He killed 20 people and injured 12. Bryant made his way to the parking lot and changed weapons to his other rifle after reaching his vehicle. He drove about a thousand feet before coming upon a woman and her two children. He killed them as well. He killed four more people in a BMW near a toll booth before stealing that car. He then came upon a man and a woman in a Toyota. He kidnapped the male and shot the female to death. Bryant drove back to the Seascape Bed and Breakfast with the hostage. He continued to shoot at motorists who he encountered along the way. He injured a few people. After arriving, Bryant set the vehicle on fire. The police negotiated with him for several hours. He killed the hostage and set the structure on fire. He attempted to escape in the confusion, but was arrested and charged with 72 crimes, including 35 counts of murder. He would initially plead not guilty, but soon after changed his plea to guilty of all the charges. He was sentenced to 35 life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 1,652 years in prison. Martin Bryant has had a rough time in prison. He spends his time in solitary confinement. He has tried to bring an end to his life several times unsuccessfully. Now moving to my analysis. After Martin Bryant's arrest, several mental health clinicians assessed him. Typically, with a case like this, one would expect a terrible family situation in the history, like parents who did not treat him well. But Bryant's history was inconsistent with that pattern. He had a relatively normal upbringing in that regard, but his behavior was still aggressive and out of control. When he made his way to school, he was bullied, and his behavior only became worse. There are several possible mental disorders that have been brought up in reference to Martin Bryant, including schizophrenia, ADHD, conduct disorder, and intellectual disability. Mental health professionals said that Bryant was distressed and disturbed, but not mentally ill, although later he would be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Bryant's IQ was reported as 66. This is just over two standard deviations below the mean, so he has fairly low intelligence. Moving to the next question. What happened with Martin Bryant? What led to his homicidal behavior? Martin Bryant repeatedly tried to fit in with society. At the same time, he demonstrated antisocial behavior, which left him isolated. His pronounced lack of insight and low intelligence combined in such a way that he could not figure out why he was being rejected. Instead of looking at his own behavior as the reason he was alone, he blamed other people. His anger for society continued to grow for some time. His father's disagreement with the Martins over real estate was the excuse Bryant needed to become the center of attention. He wanted not only the attention, but revenge. During recorded police interviews, it seems clear that Bryant enjoyed talking about the destruction he caused 
he took pleasure in each and every death. At one point, he even considered pleading guilty to only the murder charges and pleading not guilty to the attempted murder charges. He wanted his living victims to come to court and testify against him. It was his chance to once again be the center of attention. Later, he changed his mind and pleaded guilty to all 72 charges, as I mentioned. In addition to fairly pronounced narcissistic and antisocial characteristics, a few other factors came together in this case. Bryant's relationship with Helen Harvey led to a substantial inheritance. This afforded him the freedom to plan his crime and the money to buy weapons. In addition, many people found Bryant to be physically attractive, and it is believed that this actually limited how much rejection he endured. Like his behavior was so bizarre and off-putting that normally he would have been completely rejected by everybody. But that didn't happen because of his physical appearance. He was able to build a limited number of relationships. For example, he had a few girlfriends. He even had a girlfriend at the time he committed the attack. Moving to the last question, what was the impact of the Port Arthur massacre on gun rights in Australia? Bryant's attack led to significant changes in the way guns were regulated. Several restrictions were put on firearm ownership all across Australia, including in Tasmania, the island state where the shooting occurred, which historically was opposed to gun restrictions. Each country has to decide for themselves on how to manage gun rights. Several polls have indicated that about 85% of Australians agree with the restrictions. There is no constitutional right to bear arms in Australia, so it's not a fundamental right there. But if it were a fundamental right, here are my thoughts on the topic. I always worry when a fundamental right is removed from all people in order to deny some of the people the right. It's kind of like saying, I'm willing to give up my right to make sure that that person over there doesn't have it either. It's an admission that privacy rights keep us from assessing dangerous people. Obviously, guns would not be restricted if there were no dangerous individuals. But we don't have a good way to identify violent individuals because their privacy is protected. Everybody has to be encumbered in order to restrict a few people. Policy formation is always a balance. Every restriction of rights comes with a cost and a benefit. I guess as far as gun restrictions, I'm just skeptical about the benefit and have concerns about the cost. Research about the success of the restrictions has indicated that there is no statistically significant impact of the gun restrictions on the number of homicides. Homicides have decreased in the past 25 years. However, prior to the restrictions, the homicide rate in Australia had been decreasing for some time. The trend simply continued after the restrictions. It would probably be a good idea to conduct research about what factors caused the decrease prior to the restrictions. If those causes can be identified, perhaps policy can be developed to realize a further reduction in violence. In addition to my many other concerns about changes in fundamental rights, I also worry when the bad behavior of one person leads to sweeping changes. One disturbed young man affected the rights of millions of people. It makes me wonder if he really should have been given that type of power. One could argue, however, that he was just the straw that broke the camel's back. There were advocates of policy change prior to the attack. The way I look at a fundamental right is that it should only be changed when something significant is discovered in a crucial domain like human nature or technology. For example, when drones first came out, they were really not regulated. But then people realized that drones could be dangerous. They could be used to spy on people and to slam into objects on the ground and in the air, like airplanes. Therefore, that right was restricted. Before the Port Arthur Massacre, people knew that a semi-automatic rifle could be fired at people. This was not a major discovery. There was no significant change in gun technology. As far as human nature, people have been killing each other for thousands of years. The idea that somebody like Martin Bryant could become antisocial and lash out at society is not a big revelation as far as mental health and personality factors. Without a significant discovery, what was the catalyst for the change? Perhaps a dramatic increase in public awareness. Martin Bryant committed a crime so heinous that people wanted to make sure it didn't happen again. 
Again, it's important to point out that I'm talking about gun rights as fundamental here, and in Australia, it is not a constitutional right. So this is really just a theoretical argument on gun rights in general, not specific to a country that does not have that as a fundamental right. Interestingly, some of the gun restrictions that were put in place after the attack have been eased. The number of firearms per person in the population has actually increased slightly over the last 25 years, although the number of total gun owners has decreased. So those who already owned guns have purchased more. Now moving to my final thoughts. Many factors contributed to the Port Arthur massacre. Some of them, like gun ownership, can be affected directly by policy. Other factors, like mental health, are more difficult to assess and change. There will never be a satisfactory answer to that problem. There will never be a solution that completely eradicates this type of violence. Preventing somebody like Martin Bryant from executing an attack would require a change in a fundamental right, like the right of privacy. So it would be the situation where the government could just go and assess anybody they wanted at any time, and then take extreme action based on these mental health assessments. So there's always a balance between freedom and security. To eliminate these attacks with any certainty would require a great sacrifice of freedom. So again, there's always a balance. These cases are remarkably complex in that way. Those are my thoughts on Martin Bryant and the Port Arthur Massacre. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.